Welcome to New Wave Global. I'm Rabia Mahmood. New Wave is an independent news site which looks at the world through a South Asian lens and relies heavily on your feedback and support. Please do subscribe, like, comment and also engage with our work so that we can keep on improving. The UK is heading to polls on July 4. In fact, voters have been casting their votes via post already. One of the key election issues debated widely since Rishi Sunak called for a snap election by the end of May is the country's immigration and asylum policy. This debate has been so widely discussed. In fact, during the last debate between K. Starmer of the Labour Party and Rishi Sunak of the Conservative Party, there were some very weird comments made. Rishi Sunak said to Starmer that he wants to sit with the Ayatollahs. And Starmer, in one of his appearances, made a derogatory comment against the Bangladeshi migrants or the Bangladeshi community of the UK, which is quite bizarre. The media and others even called it racist. Of course, the debate and policy around this issue impacts Pakistanis, Afghans, Indians, Bangladeshis, Sri Lankan and others moving to the UK, especially from what is called the Global South or the countries which the UK had colonized back in the day. And this debate impacts economic migrants or others who are seeking asylum because they are fleeing violence, conflict, persecution back in their own countries. To speak more about this, we, we have with us Nilmani Rollins, a solicitor and an expert of immigration law. She has worked extensively in the field of business immigration and also on protection cases of refugees who are religious and ethnic minorities back in their own countries. And these countries include Pakistan, India, Somalia and Eritrea. To work on the cases of these said groups, she has also traveled to Malaysia, Thailand, Pakistan and elsewhere. Nilmini also trains immigration lawyers and provides legal counsel for cases of skilled workers, for example, software engineers and family migration. Welcome Nilmini, welcome to New Wave Global. Thank you for joining us. Thank Firstly, you. Firstly, please tell us as to why the Conservative government's immigration policy has been such a disaster, for the lack of a better word. And why is it so important that it was discussed during the campaign and during the last debate be between Sunak and Starmer as well? Um, and if, if you can please expand on this a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me, first of all, Rabia. Um, immigration is a hot topic. It's discussed daily in the UK, um, and so it formed part of the election campaign as well. Um, I think in some ways the, the Conservatives made a rod for, own, for their own backs by dwelling a lot on the small boats issue and also on by focusing on net migration as a target. Um, the net migration issue was inappropriate in my view. Um, for that time, um, because of the fact that we've had uh, um, uh, a Ukraine scheme where they've allowed quite large numbers of people. Um, we've had Brexit, which meant that people um, who previously didn't come into the immigration figures now form part of the visa figures. So it distorts um, the the net migration figures to a large extent. Um, there are other elements as well, the BNO scheme. Um, so a lot of schemes that they have actually created have distorted the net migration figures, which meant that net migration actually went up in the last few years. So that, in effect, meant that for the Conservatives, making it a, a real goal um, has been very detrimental to them because it, it's actually backfired. Similarly, the small boats, um, The I think it was Preeti Patel who started talking about small boats, one of the previous um, Home Secretaries, um, and then Rishi Sunak actually mm -hmm. took that to heart and started talking a lot about small boats in the last few months. But again, they haven't been managed to get on top of it. Um, it's impossible to, to stop the small boats, which is what they've set out to do. So in many ways, 
they have created a lot of problems for themselves. Uh, Nilmini, can you, for the sake of our viewers, tell us what this small boat, small boats mean, and also a bit about the Rwanda policy? Because I was just reading up uh, some coverage of this in uh, the UK papers that a that that you know the immig the war on immigration by Rishi Sunak and Tories has backfired, and also the kind of money which has been spent spent on the Rwanda policy. And so can you please just uh, tell us a yeah. bit of something about what exactly do these issues mean? So it's, well, in, in essence, um, because a lot of migrants come from various countries by land, initially maybe they might cross the Mediterranean and then they go across land and then they end up in places like Calais uh, in France, in Northern France. Um, and from there, they try to get into the UK and because, well, first of all, because there are no um, proper legal routes for a lot of these people um, and there are no visas for, for as claiming asylum. They have no choice but to try and enter illegally. So um, once upon a time, they used to come in the back of a lorry when a lorry crossed from Calais to um, Dover. They get into the back of a lorry and come into the UK that way. Uh, but more recently, uh, there's been an effort to um, uh, the traffickers, um, human traffickers, have been um, arranging little boats and masses of people get onto these boats and then they cross the channel um, by that means. Um, it's a very dangerous way to cross and lots of people have actually um, lost their lives by trying to do that. And um, with people like Preeti Patel, who actually tried to push back, um, I think at the time she even brought... Um, UK gunboats to try and push back very tiny, minuscule boats. Um, so it's it's been a, a real political um, thing that they've blown out of proportion to a large extent because the actual numbers that come in through the small boats are, are very small compared with um, the number of refugees that seek sanctuary in neighbouring countries, for example, from from those countries that actually create um, uh, asylum seekers. And the so, Rwanda policy? The Rwanda policy, well, this is about the, the UK, because it's been a magnet for um, migrants all, um, all around, but then especially asylum seekers from those previous colonies, as you mentioned, they tend to come to the UK um, maybe they might have they might have uh, family links that so they might have um, be drawn here for other reasons. Now, when they um, get here, because it puts a lot of pressure on the local resources, whether it's housing, education, uh, and um, all the 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 other resources in the UK, uh, and the UK is also very protective about its welfare system, the NHS. So, in order to find a solution for a lot of asylum seekers coming, um, they came up with this Rwanda plan. They thought one way of getting out of their international obligations might be to provide for processing outside of the UK um, and then providing sanctuary outside of the UK. That way, the international obligation to provide sanctuary to people fleeing persecution can be met by another country rather than the UK itself. So they struck a deal with Rwanda but from the start, it was doomed for failure. Um, there are lots of legal challenges against it, and it actually cost an awful lot of money, um, and they paid out quite large sums of money to the Rwandan government. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened with all of that. But um, at the end of the day, um, now we've got elections in a couple of days' time, um, and um, Labour uh, has actually said that they will scrap it. So mm -hmm. it, after all that effort, and a lot of heartache and a lot of stress all around, um, we might not see it anymore, which is actually a good thing, but um, there you have it. Okay, okay. So uh, what do you think, you're saying, so let's address this issue now. I wanted to speak about this a bit later in the interview, but like you're saying that Labour has said that they will scrap the Rwanda policy. And Stama has also said recently that he's not going to de deport the Afghan asylum seekers, because previously it was uh, said that he's going to clear the backlog of cases. 
of asylum seekers. So what do you think are the implications if this policy does not change much? Do you think it's going to be changed significantly? Like, I mean, I know things, I mean, you don't know at the moment and uh, things are developing, but it is a key issue. So uh, if you can speak to us a bit about that, you know, I mean, what are the, going to be the implications for asylum seekers? Let's address the human rights concerns at the moment, and then we'll go to the economic migrants and other kind of immigration as well. Please. Sure. Um, well, Starmer has said that he will introduce a new uh, border security command, uh, a, a new concept. Um, and the idea is to catch traffickers, human traffickers upstream, rather than waiting for the individuals to actually cross the channel and or enter illegally uh, where they might be um, pushed back. Um, and the, the, the conservatives have focused on a kind of um, um, pushing back and enforcement, detention, that has been their focus, quite harsh kind of set, set of measures. Whereas what Starmer seems to be proposing is to try and catch the traffickers themselves rather than punishing the individuals who try and get here. Um, well, we have to wait and see because politicians say all sorts of things during the, the lead up to elections. But when it comes to actually managing the economy, managing immigration policies and all the other things that they have to do, um, they tend to pander to or, or respond to public opinion and quite a lot of the time public opinions formulated by the media or, or politicians themselves who who sometimes do whip up um, feelings. Feelings, okay. Do you think that there has been uh, the immigrants or this issue, especially, I mean immigrants have been demonized in any way over the past few years through what the Tories have done, I mean, it was discussed the way it has been discussed recently. I mean, all these examples of the comment on Bangladeshis and Ayatollahs and all. Do you think it's been demonized and uh, it's led to more more um, sentiment against people who are not, for the lack of a better word, white in the UK? Yes, uh, I mean, it's been going on for many decades. Um, it's not recent, the demonizing of um, migrants and especially people of color. Um, I mean, you can go back to the time of Enoch Powell, um, but um, I think in a not kind of way, um, Brexit has also had played a part because, mm -hmm. because of Brexit, uh, vast swathes of Europeans actually went back home um, feeling quite annoyed. <laughs> um, and, and then the UK um, suffered a certain vacuum uh, of labor and, and lots of other issues came about as a result of Brexit. And so then they had to introduce um, schemes to enable um, the rest of the world to get here, to meet those labor demands. And so then that, that itself has knock on effects so now you've got um, a, a different type of migration. And so they now have to handle that. Um, so they now introduce other measures, um, tinkering. There's constant tinkering with immigration laws, the rules, mm -hmm. to try and manage it. I think in terms of um, particularly uh, being anti um, uh, people of color, um, that's always been there, unfortunately. Um, but I think that's probably most stark in the way that some of the schemes have been rolled out. If you look at the Ukraine scheme, for example, within a week of the Russian invasion, they introduced um, schemes to welcome refugees, um, people who are who are needing um, uh, protection um, uh, within a week. So you have the home for homes for Ukraine. You've got the family uh, scheme for Ukrainians. Um, very quickly contrast that with the Afghan situation. You know, you you might have had about fifteen thousand people who were who were um, brought out uh, with the initial operation, um, but after that, um, very few people have actually been 
granted any kind of sanctuary through the Afghan scheme um, compared with over 200,000 in the Ukraine. I, I'm not quite sure of the exact figures, but you're probably looking at about 6,000 something in the Afghan scheme. So it's it's very stark how, and then also think about Gaza. There's absolutely mm -hmm. no offer for people from Gaza whatsoever. Um, and uh, it's been kind of pushed back to, we'll consider it after the elections because there's been petitions and things asking for uh, a proper resettlement scheme for Gazans, but nothing's on offer yet. So Nilmani, coming to the issue of other kind of immigration cases that you also do, um, let's speak a bit about the graduate visa scheme you know, and this addresses your point about net migration. There's been an effort to uh, reduce it overall. And yet there are thousands and thousands of students. I mean, I was looking at some of the figures from a home office report that Indians, dominant, uh, dominantly Indians, but Chinese, Nigerians and Pakistanis make up for a large number of students who go to study in the U.S., uh, in the who go to study in the UK and uh, the UK allowed them to stay back for two years. And there was a period when this was uh, made controversial. You know, Sunak had said that they're going to roll back this scheme. For now, it stays because there's a report that there is no abuse there. And the universities also took a stance uh, as they want more students to study in their institutions. How do you see these kinds of policies as well? Please. Yes, I mean, uh, once again, it's very um, short term thinking, in, in my view, uh, with regard to the way the government's approaching the, the student visa routes and the graduate um, routes, because um, the graduate routes actually existed previously. Um, the, the HSMP, for example, is a predecessor to the graduate route. Um, but then they decided, oh, lots of people are abusing this route because rather than contributing to the economy by graduates by going on to, you know, doing doing high flying kind of jobs or setting up businesses, instead they're working at McDonald's, so it's a complete abuse. So therefore, they actually scrapped it for a while, and then they realised it's got an impact on the student visas that international students are discouraged um, as a result of scrapping that. Um, visa. So they reintroduced the graduate route. So they're constantly tinkering, tinkering, <laughs> there's no end to it. Um, and so um, the graduate route, again, as part of this net migration, um, reduction of net migration agenda, they thought, okay, let's look at what we can do to cut down number of legal migrants as well. So therefore, they started focusing on the students, and care workers. So the students, they decided to um, to stop them bringing their dependents. To, again, that had an impact on the numbers of students coming here. Um, and then, you know, that's got implications for the economy because if you cut down the, um, the dependents coming, then obviously bright people who could actually come here and for in the first instance, contribute to the university fees, and the UK universities need those uh, international um, students to come. Um, that's lost to the country. Um, and secondly, people who are very bright, you know, they, they talked about attracting the brightest and the best, but they're discouraged from coming here because they, they take away the right uh, to bring their dependents. Um, and they took away the right to settle for students. So it's not a settlement route. So all these measures are constantly with a view to cut down net migration, but I think it's very short term and it will have consequences um, for the economy in the UK. But um, because it's such a political thing, they have to be seen to be doing something. So they're constantly responding to public opinion. They have to look as though they're tough on immigration. So they try and they've used this artificial kind of means of looking at the net migration figures. As I said earlier on, it's it's very distorted. So it's, it's a very um, inappropriate way of looking at how to manage migration. So uh, based on the cases you've worked on, you know, for, in for instance, the software engineers cases or family migration cases, and in fact, even the 
cases of asylum seekers, you know, protection cases that you've done. How has your work gotten difficult or other lawyers like you? Well, I think <laughs> immigration law is perhaps one of the most difficult areas of the law to practice in in the UK because they are constantly changing. So what you know today will no longer be tr true tomorrow. I mean, that, I mean, a stark example is investor category, for example. One day you had it, and then just shortly before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, suddenly um, investor category was gone. Um, so <laughs> overnight, virtually, with very little warning. Um, but you you got that not so rapidly, but uh, but constantly they are tinkering with the immigration rules, try and make it harder and harder and harder. But then they realize, oh, okay, we've got employers, industry um, that are demanding labor here, for example, the care work sector. And therefore they had to suddenly open up um, some kind of uh, means of getting them here by uh, including them in the shortage occupation list. And then they realized, hold on, we've got to manage the, the immigration. So we, we will get rid of the shortage occupation list altogether. And so now the what was the shortage occupation list is much, much smaller in an immigration salary list instead. And so they also try to manage skilled migration by increasing the the salary thresholds that uh, that must be paid so it makes it very difficult for employers to hire from overseas but the the people who the employers who can afford it and the people who are skilled they can still come here but it just makes it very difficult to practice in this area because it's constantly changing whatever governments in power they are not looking at the needs of the economy. They're not listening to employers. Um, if they were to do that, they would actually serve the country better and manage migration better. Um, whereas what they tend to be doing is responding to this so-called public opinion that's actually not really the public opinion, but it's been kind of created it's a, it's a it's a it's been manufactured it's manufactured yes it's manufactured public opinion so that's a shame thank you nilmani for your insights i hope this would be of uh, use and of interest to our viewers as well thank you for watching new wave global khudafiz